Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If I can have your attention, please. Good evening. Thank you. My name is uh, Ian Whitaker. I'm the Assistant Director for uh, Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Richard Haas to the Council this evening. Um, and we, we thank the, the Council on Foreign Relations for partnering on this event. Um, and copies of Dr. Haas's book, uh, World in Disarray, will be available for sale and signing after the program from our partners at the bookseller that's just going to be outside the conference centre today. Um, a few quick housekeeping points. We're on the record. Uh, we're live streaming. We uh, welcome social media, but please silence your phones. Um, for nearly a century, the Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, non-partisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement in the world. Uh, views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Um, we organize over 200 events a year, and just looking ahead, some, some quick highlights. Um, this week, uh, on Wednesday, we'll have a discussion on the future of trade. Uh, there'll be a panel discussion with Gary Huffbauer of the Peterson Institute, uh, Thea Lee of the AFL-CIO, um, Phil Levy of the Chicago Council, and moderated by Sean Donan of the Financial Times. On Thursday, we'll have a, another uh, panel discussion, this time on uh, whether this is the Asian century. Uh, this will be with Michael Oslin of the American Enterprise Institute, Carl Friedhoff of the Chicago Council, Deborah Lair of the Paulson Institute, and moderated by Phil Levy of the Chicago Council. And looking a little bit further ahead, on uh, February 23rd, we'll discuss the, the future of work, and that'll be with uh, Rick Wartsman of the Drucker Institute, and Amy Webb of the Future Trends Institute and other panelists. Um, turning back to this evening's program, after the conversation, we'll open up to audience questions. Um, audience members can raise their hands as they always have done, or if you're watching online, you can submit a question via our app. Um, if you have an internet-enabled device, please type chi.cnf.io. That'll be displayed on the screen shortly. Into your browser and uh, select today's program. And you can type your question, and you can vote on other people's questions too. Um, but now to introduce our program and our speakers, please join me in welcoming Chicago Council board member and a distinguished fellow and former U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands, Faye hutter -Gleiman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Council on Global Affairs, thank you for joining us this evening. If you watched Fareed Zakaria yesterday or Morning Joe this morning, Tonight's program will be a double header with Richard Haas. The world, the world is in a mounting state of disarray, Richard Haas argues in his timely new book. From the Syrian conflict and waves of global refugees to rising populism, the disarray grows more visible by the week. We question whether the liberal international order built in the post-war years is capable of managing the simultaneous complex crises we face today. Globalization, climate change, technology, and non-state actors are challenging the ability of governments to govern effectively and to protect their citizens. For America in particular, this age of disarray multiplies the risks and complexities of global leadership. But, as Dr. Haas argues, what the U.S. does or does not do in the coming years will have a tremendous effect on whether the world further destabilizes or a new international system emerges. How did the world arrive in today's period of volatility? Will countries stop relying on the United States for economic and military security and devolve into a new period of self-help? Can America isolate itself from this instability? And what can the Trump administration do and avoid doing to build a more stable world order? We look forward to the conversation this evening between two foreign policy eminences who have given much thought to these questions. Richard Haas is president of the Council on Foreign, foreign Relations, a position he has held for 14 years. He was previously the Director of Policy Planning at the Department of State from 2001 to 2003. And he was Special Assistant to President George H.W. Bush and Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council. Ivo Dalder is President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He is a former Ambassador to NATO under President Obama and served on President Clinton's National Security Council staff as Director for European Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Richard Haas to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs.
Uh, Faith, thanks so much for that kind introduction. Richard, great to have you here. Great uh, to be here. By the way, at the end of the evening, we're going to have a vote on whose socks you like more. And uh, <laughs> we're going <laughs> to. I said, <laughs> when you're. Uh, when you're president of a think tank, the best thing you can do is get nice socks because there's not much else you get. Oh, uh, that's tough. That's tough. Anyway, uh, congrats on the book. Thank you. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, uh, in many ways, it's got a lot of your previous books all in, in, into one. It's really a, a tour de force. And for those of you who haven't read it, uh, uh, bought it. Actually, it's probably what you're more important for some people. But Reddit, uh, do. So I'm really looking forward to having a discussion about this. I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions about the future uh, of our country and foreign policy. So we're going to talk a, a little bit more about how we got where we are. So first, first question I want to ask you is, is, why did you write this book? And if you were to start writing it today, how would it differ, be different? <laughs> well, first of all, it's great to be here. My old sidekick here. And it's Congratulations on this extraordinary facility and all that you and your colleagues are, are doing. Uh, why did I write this book? I've been struggling with these themes, as you suggested, for, for years or even decades. Indeed, in the course of writing this book, uh, I went back and reread a lot of what I'd, written, what I'd read as a graduate student at Oxford uh, four decades ago. And thought hard about some of the issues. I had to give a series of lectures at uh, Cambridge, University of Cambridge in, in this, what, about two years ago now? Uh, I wrote it because I thought that whoever was the next president of the United States, he or she, was going to inherit an extraordinarily difficult, daunting inbox of challenges, at the risk of getting ahead of ourselves, in part for structural reasons, but also in part because of things the United States had done or not done over the, uh, over the decades. And I thought that in many ways the intellectual architecture of American foreign policy was increasingly out of date. And I, the subtitle of this book is about the crisis of the old order, and it applies to two things. It applies to the crisis of the old order internationally. A lot of the institutions and arrangements are essentially post-World War, World War II developments and as creative and as extraordinary as they were, that's 70 years ago. And so much has happened uh, since. And then secondly, a lot of the intellectual architecture of American foreign policy was also fairly exhausted. I mean, containment was the great compass. That essentially ran its course with its success 25 years ago. And ever since then, we have been in some ways navigating the world without much in the way of a compass. So this was my attempt to basically uh, come up with that, and it began with a single question. Like, very early on, I hit a, you know, Evo asked why I wrote it, I hit a, I hit a, a puzzle, and, and when I write, and my only recommendation for would-be writers are, I don't sit at the keyboard when I can't answer something or figure it out, I walk around Central Park, and here you, you have your equivalent. So I got a lot of laps in around the uh, park. And it was this, when you study the last few hundred years of history, the principal driver of history, what essentially makes it what it is, uh, more often than not, is great power dynamics, much of which is uh, pretty depressing stuff. Wars, particularly look at the 20th century, two world wars, a cold war. What was interesting to me, and it was the question that in some ways lit the fuse that led to the book was, when I look at great power relations, and this is several years ago, they weren't bad. US, China, even US, Russia, yeah, a little bit rough around the edges, but not particularly bad. The other relationships, not bad. Certainly compared to history, not at all bad. Yet things weren't very good in the world. And I couldn't, so what's different about this era of history in that the principal determinant of the last three or four centuries was largely missing, yet things still weren't very good? And that, that suggested to me that something was afoot that was qualitatively different. And that was the beginning of the, the path that led me to the analysis that I came up with. And that ultimately led me to think about, well, how did US foreign policy need to change uh, correspondingly? We can talk about it. If I, if I were to write the book now, it would be somewhat different. And I'll just tell you one story. Uh, one of the things I do when I write books, again, I recommend it, is uh, after I write a first draft, I have a number of people read it. And I think really hard, one, it's a lot to ask. To ask somebody to read you know, three, 400 pages of manuscript, yeah, not easy. Uh, but second of all, I always want to get a range of views. 
So I always ask a couple, in this case, foreign policy wonks. But then I also ask a couple of journalists. You also want, you want to anticipate your audience and get different, because this is a book that try, I tried to make accessible uh, to people who didn't come, come to it with great background. The three uh, people who were most expert in foreign policy, the one common reaction is you're way too negative. That uh, world in disarray, oh yeah, you're just much too negative, things are better than that. And I heard them out and I said, yeah, I hear you, I, I disagree. And this is maybe eight, nine months ago. If I were to write the book today, the only question would be, is, uh, what's, is disarray a strong enough characterization <laughs> to capture where we are? Uh, the arrows are pointed, things are moving pretty fast. That would be the, I never, my kids call me Daddy Downer. Uh, I've never been accused of being upbeat before. It shocks me that a, a book called The World in Disarray may be criticized as being too upbeat. <laughs> you, you, uh, you begin the book with a quote from uh, the first President Bush, who you worked for uh, for four years, who, speaking to a joint session of Congress in September 1990, that's after the Berlin Wall came down, Russian troops had withdrawn from, or were withdrawing from Eastern Europe, a large global coalition had been assembled and successfully reversed the invasion uh, uh, by Iraq of, of Kuwait. Uh, and you quote him, well, let me read the passage because I think it's, 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 a, it's a good way to think about where we were and where we, where we um, are heading. Uh, George Bush, George H.W. Bush said, uh, out of these troubled times, the ones that they had just left, a new world order can emerge a new era freer from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace, an era in which the nations of the world, east and west, north and south, can prosper and live in harmony. A hundred generations have searched for this elusive path to peace while a thousand wars raged across the span of human endeavor. Today that new world is struggling to be born, a world quite different from the one we've known, a world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle, a world in which nations recognize the shared responsibility uh, for freedom and justice, a world where the strong respect the right of the weak. George H.W. Bush, September 1990. What went wrong? I'll answer that, but one, it is inconceivable to imagine such a speech being given today. Inconceivable. Uh, what went wrong? Uh, some things just happened. Not everything went wrong. Some things just happened. History, you know, history is what happens, you know, while you're doing other stuff. And you have countries rising. You had, you know, the U.S., the United States, its absolute power, wealth, military power is increased, but our relative share in many cases has decreased simply because of the rise of others. It's easier for others who begin from a lower baseline to rise at faster uh, clips. There's more low-hanging fruit for them to pick in the case of China. And uh, so you have a, a world, I, in a previous piece of writing, I called it, it's a non-polar world where things, capacity got distributed uh, much more uh, broadly. So that's one thing that happened. Second thing that happened is when the Cold War ended, a lot of discipline went with it. Whatever else you thought of the Cold War, it was a pretty disciplined international era. The United States and the Soviet Union were understandably afraid that if anything got out of hand, it could quickly escalate, bring the two of them into direct conflict, and who knew how things might escalate. So as a result, it was, uh, each of them managed respective alliance systems uh, and respective clients. Uh, and when that ended, again, capacity and also decision making uh, spread uh, with it. Globalization gained a lot of uh, speed and range and depth. So problems that didn't really exist or we didn't recognize them, like climate change 25 years ago, suddenly had uh, reached the point uh, you know, now where they were, were serious uh, problems. So I think some of these things were structural. So one, one part of the explanation is, again, things changed. And I would simply say there was a gap between what was happening in reality and the policy response. We can get to that a little bit. Secondly, I think the United States exacerbated it by uh, things we did. The top of the list, I would put probably the 2003 Iraq War both what was done and how it was, how it was, uh, 
how it was done and had real consequences for the Middle East in terms of upsetting balances, unleashing Iran, which was in some ways the principal strategic beneficiary of the conflict that poisoned a lot of Sunni Shia uh, relations around the, uh, the region. It bred a certain contempt for the United States. It built in some terrorism into the, into the woodwork. Things that were done subsequently by uh, his successor, I would say there, uh, the Libya invasion, uh, which destabilized Libya, but also, I think, further alienated Russia and China from working with us on certain issues. And then the decision to pull US troops out of Iraq after Iraq, in some ways, had been largely restabilized because of this, the Sunni awakening and the uh, surge. Uh, to pull them out, uh, I thought, uh, was a mistake to put US troops in Afghanistan on an arbitrary calendar rather than to base how long they'd stay based on conditions of the ground, and then things we didn't do. And this, most of them are, are called Syria, and we you know, no need to repeat that, but a lot of things that were not done in the course of the struggle in Syria, which then had all sorts of repercussions for terrorism, for refugee flows, which poisoned European uh, politics, which raised fundamental doubts around the world about a U.S. Uh, credibility and re rely, uh, reliability. What we didn't do in Libya in the follow-up to the, uh, the invasion. So if you add up this combination of uh, structural changes, acts of commission, and acts of omission, you get to it. And just today we had another, you can call, I'm not sure, I guess I would call it an act of omission, which is the the, the failure to make good on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that added significantly to the, it's one of the reasons, again, if I were to write the book now, I'd be more negative, is uh, you know, economically we lost a contribution to global GDP, whether it's 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5%, we could, we could argue. It uh, once again highlights American unpredictability and a lack of uh, certainty particularly for allies who paid a certain political price to, 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 you know, to, uh, to line up for it. It, I think, creates certain opportunities for, for China and others. It's really tragic because it's done in the name of helping American workers and it won't. Uh, indeed, it's a typical example now of trade being scapegoated for what is largely a separate phenomenon, which is job disappearance because of productivity and innovation. But again, this is another way in which we're, you know, the, the free trade policy, it's really a century old and predated World War II, if you go back to the old reciprocal tariffs agreements of the 30s. And what, what we've done is you know, we've reduced something that's contributed to Western economic growth and development, to Western alliance systems, and was an inhibitor against what f would foes or actual or would be might do, because it gave them a stake in the, the status quo. So I think you know, this is, again, a, a palpable example of why the arrows are pointing in the direction of greater disarray. You've emphasized structural uh, uh, elements and U.S. policy. Basically, you know, we can debate the degree to which. Yep. Uh, are there other agents that were part of parcel of this? What, what else was going on? Because it, the, the story of this is a book about American foreign policy, so it makes sense to yeah. talk about American foreign policy. But what else was going on to... Uh, in other countries or other agents or other sure. means that we're, we're trying to change that system and make Couple the new things. world order different? Well, one, and we see it in our country, and it's, again, it's related to TPP, but also Brexit, the whole uh, revolt against immigration and against openness, whether it's to people, to goods, what have you. And this sense of, uh, you know, again, we can, I think people overinterpret the Brexit vote. I do think it had more to do with uh, immigration rather than with uh, over-regulation by Brussels. But again, it is part of a larger uh, discontent with certain aspects of, of globalization and concern about uh, economic uh, futures. So I think there's, that's uh, something we're seeing throughout the, the developed world. I think we're also seeing, I think Russia uh, is clearly emerged as a more alienated country. And Henry Kissinger once wrote a book where he talked about things that I talk about in this book, about legitimacy and order. And he talked about revolutionary countries, which were countries that didn't buy into, didn't accept the, the rules of the day, the norms, and had the capacity to do something about it. Well, Russia has certain elements of that now. It's both an anti-status quo country, and it has a willingness and an ability to, to use its military strength in certain uh, contexts. And we can talk about how things reach that point. 
To what extent was that an inevitable result of Russian political culture? To what extent, in some ways, did we violate Churchill's dictum of uh, in victory magnanimity in the way we handled the post-Cold War aftermath at, at various uh, phases? That's one of those issues, by the way, that historians will probably debate far, far into the uh, future, or, or a bit of both, I would. Uh, uh, but, but Russian alienation is uh, something. Uh, the North Korean thing, and, the, and more broadly proliferation, as you know, India, Pakistan, and, and others, it's just proven extremely hard to stop. If countries really, really want to develop nuclear arms, uh, often their commitment and ability to do it outweighs your desire that they don't. And it's a, it's a general rule of international relations, whether the United States or others, we're thinking of the whole chessboard, to use a cliche, and we've got to think about trade-offs and how many, to switch my metaphors, uh, how many eggs can we put into this specific basket, where for other countries, that's their entire basket. They'll put all their eggs into it, which gives them, so even if you're objectively stronger, the commitment and capacity they're willing to bring to a certain issue may actually outweigh what you're willing and able to bring, because you've got a lot of other issues to worry about. And that's what often we see in the case of, um, of proliferation. So I'm not saying that everything that happened was the result of foreign policy flaws. And I used to teach at uh, Harvard. I used to, after I got done telling the students that there was only one person in the room who wasn't smart enough to be accepted at Harvard and not to worry, I was almost over it and their grades wouldn't suffer. Uh, once I got done with that spiel, uh, the, the other thing I would remind them is foreign policy is hard. And there really are some awfully difficult uh, trade-offs. So again, I think some of these things happened. And I'll give you one other example, the risk of going on too long. In the early 90s, the Clinton administration got the intelligence that North Korea was about to take their fuel rods out of these so-called cooling, cooling ponds and move them underground where we probably wouldn't be able to destroy them. OK, so certain people like me and Brent Scowcroft from the outside as well as other people from the inside were arguing, well, this is a time to use military force. Because once North Korea makes this move, it's Katie bar the door. And the problem was obviously, if we had used military force, there was the chance that North Korea would retaliate with conventional forces, and the Korean Peninsula would have been engulfed in a war, where thousands of Americans and hundreds of thousands, if not more, South Koreans would have lost their lives. And so it's the question of whether to use military force was anything but a simple one. The fact that it wasn't used, though, had consequences, which is one of the reasons we, were, we are where we are where we are today with, with North Korea. So again, I think there's some things we could and should have done differently historically, and I feel pretty confident in it. There's other things uh, that I think the trade-offs are, are closer calls. You mentioned Kissinger uh, and the world, his book, The World Restored, the, the issue of legitimacy and whether great power, particularly great powers, which is what matters, accept that legitimacy. You, I think, for the, again, for those who are not familiar with this kind of thinking, the book really lays out very nicely how to think about uh, the 19th century, going back, what, 200 years or so, uh, as well as how to think about the post-war uh, the, the period, the interwar period. Uh, you, you end uh, with the hope that we can reestablish a sense of legitimacy, at least among the great powers. Uh, you already raised the question whether, whether Russia is, uh, is right. willing or to play that game. Um, talk about why that is possible, and then let's talk about what's the alternative to that. OK, well, the idea or of what? legitimacy is, at any one time, is uh, what are the rules of international relations, and how are they set, and how are they amended? And what, what international order requires is a broadly shared sense of legitimacy. What are the rules and how are they to be made and changed? And then a balance of power to ensure that those who don't buy into it can't turn it over. That's essentially what international order is, is, is mostly uh, about. And you know, my argument is simply that the, the basic building block of international order for three, four centuries was this idea of sovereignty and had two dimensions. One is you don't change borders by force. And two is you pretty much respect the prerogatives of governments to do what they want within their borders. And it's a mutual live and let live society. And, that, and, and it worked. I mean, obviously, it was violated time and time again. But the basic ideas worked. And my argument now is these are still valuable ideas. We don't want to have what we saw with Iraq against Kuwait or Russia against Ukraine. We want to have respect for, for, for borders. 
Uh, I think we have to accept that governments have a lot of leeway to do as they will within their borders. Not complete, but a lot of leeway. My argument is simply that it's no longer adequate, that we're living in a world uh, of globalization where, if I had to sum it up, nothing stays local for, for long. So whether it's a computer hacker or a, uh, a virus that comes out of some barely main, badly maintained poultry uh, farm, or there's coal burning, uh, electricity generating plants that contribute to climate change, uh, or proliferation, or what have you, terrorists operating out of a country, uh, we no longer have the luxury of saying, well, this is, a, this is happening internal over there, so we're, we're going to leave it, because every one of these things doesn't respect borders. And they can come back and bite us. And so what I'm basically saying is the old model of the world uh, is necessary. Again, I don't want to have a world of frequent interventions of conflict, but it's necessary but no longer sufficient. And we need to have a, an, a, an approach to international order that reflects and recognizes that nothing stays local for long. And what seems to be internal has very quickly, even instantaneously, the ability to be external in ways that could affect us significantly. So what we need now are states to take on the added obligation, I call it sovereign obligation, uh, to police, monitor, control, regulate what goes on inside their territory if those things can affect others. And I call this World Order 2.0. So it's, it's a sovereignty plus system. And what we have to do is encourage countries to, to recognize and do something about this, to give them capacity if they don't have it, and, but also to penalize them if need be if they simply won't meet these obligations and we see it as threatening. And the, the, uh, and the penalties could be everything from sanctions to naming and shaming. And on occasion, it could involve the use of, of military force of one sort or another or cyber uh, in, in an offensive way. But essentially, in an interconnected world, we either come to this greater understanding of, of global order uh, or we are all going to pay. Uh, we'll go, my next book will be, instead of a world in disarray, it'll be a world in chaos. I do not want to write that book. The key to that is the great powers accepting that form of legitimacy. Right. Go by the three powers, and you know this yep. is where it's a little different today. Sure. That chapter, I think, would be a little different yep. today than it would be when you wrote it. But talk about Russia, talk about China, talk about yep. um, the United States, yep. any other power. You want to talk about the EU as a power managing that system. Yep. How likely is it that they will accept this new okay. sovereign obligation? Fair enough. But even in the, uh, again, I never thought I'd use this adjective, in the more optimistic version, <laughs> uh, it's a word I've never been associated with uh, in my career. Uh, I said this is, this is the stuff of a generation. Yeah. This is not a negotiation. It's not even a pre-negotiation. This is, this is the stuff of conversation for now. You gotta, you know, ideas need to be developed, circulated. You consult about it. Only when there's considerable consensus can you begin to lock them in. And I said this is the stuff of, of administrations in the plural. This, this could be a 20-year a generational uh, exercise. And it, it's going to possibly be, and I said it would also be uneven. You'd have degrees of acceptance by some in some areas and so forth. I think with China, I think your chances are okay in many areas. I think China is increasingly an integrated country economically. It's not autarchical by any means. I think under the Deng Xiaoping mentality that China needs a stable periphery and exterior in order to focus on internal political and economic <laughs> development. I think the Chinese are not unalterably opposed to a lot of uh, these things. They're, they've changed big time in their view on climate change, in part because the air quality in China has become a major issue uh, and a major source of regime uh, criticism. I think they see the benefits of certain aspects of an open economic order. There's things they're doing in there I don't, I don't like in terms of state subsidies, property theft, and all that. So I'm not, I'm not whitewashing Chinese behavior. But I think ultimately China sees the importance of a global trading and investment uh, and monetary regime that works to their uh, advantage. They don't want there to be another war on the Korean Peninsula. So they have certain incentives to do certain things there. They're worried about terrorism. So I actually think China is a potential participant. You know, again, I'm not saying they're there now and it's, it's going to be easy. But I, I do not see China in any way as a revolutionary power. I think the, the potential for China to be somewhat included, particularly if they're brought into this. This is not something that's made in America and we impose it on others. The Chinese would be part of it. Uh, so I think there's a decent chance. I think Russia is much more problematic. 
it's much less integrated eco economically. Russia is not a particularly integrated economic uh, power. There is a sense of uh, resentment or humiliation that gets uh, exercised. There's less institutional influence inside Russian decision making than there is in, in Chinese. So I, I think Russia will be tougher. And my hunch is they will lag. Uh, so on the other hand, there might be some places they, would, they could help conceivably with counterterrorism or counterproliferation. They don't want to see those things necessarily uh, either. But I think Russia is more of an outlier than uh, Europe. The problem is that even if they were to agree on this, they're so preoccupied with what they've got. Europe has uh, got its plate full and its hands full dealing with everything from financial crises to refugee issues to, to Brexit to Russian uh, intimidation. So, to low economic growth, to nationalist and populist movements. So the, the problem with Europe is not that it might be disinclined to help in some of these areas. I think their ability to focus and contribute meaningful resources. I mean, you'd know this better than I do, given your experience. But I just think Europe, again, is its, it's, it's ability to be a, an effective partner these days is seriously uh, limited by their, by their state. And I think you know, other countries, Japan could be helpful, South Korea on occasion, even India on some things more and more. Again, this, but this to me, this is the stuff of a long-term proposition that uh, national security advisors and secretaries of states and their senior lieutenants, this would now become part of their, uh, part of their agenda. While they're, while they're putting out fires, while they're dealing with the immediate issues, this would become of a, a part of a, a longer-term enterprise. You recognize in your book something that I, that I think most theorists of international politics and practitioners have dealt with, which is the emergence of non-state actors. So in one sense, you have a theory of international politics, which is really based not only on states, sovereignty, but great powers. Right. And yet, you now have this emergence of sure. terrorist groups, multinational corporations, states and cities that are becoming actors in that global, in, in, in a more global arena. And so how do you marry, and you, you address it briefly, but I want to sure. push a little on it. How do you marry the, the reality of many more Go. actors on the stage with a order concept that's based on sovereignty? Well, again, I think you have to differentiate between those who are benign and those who are malign. For groups like ISIS or Al Qaeda, there's, there's no way you ever include them in anything, and you have to defeat them as best you can. So that's a, that's a different sort of issue. I think with other groups, I think the biggest question is you have to find a way to give them a role. Uh, Ban Ki-moon, early on in his tenure as UN Secretary General, uh, got in touch with me one day and basically wanted to look at global health issues and asked if I'd help pull together a meeting. And I said, sure. And when we thought of who to invite, it became an interesting question because you realize you couldn't just have the WHO and some ministers of health. You had to have pharmaceutical companies, and then you had to have groups like Médecins Sans Frontières and others. And it reminded me when I was put in charge of Afghanistan after 9-11, I used to call meetings in my office. And again, I had all the US government agencies. But again, I had to have you know, refugee groups and people on the ground uh, who were NGOs. And so I think what we've got to figure out is uh, we've got to expand participation. Um, you know, I'm not saying you necessarily get people seats in the Security Council, though, by the way, the, there's not one person in this room who would design this Security Council if given a pen and, pen, a pen and paper to do so. It's one of the areas where, again, institutions haven't kept up with changing uh, reality. So you need to find new forms or invent and find participants who reflect the, uh, the powers that be. So I think we have to accept the fact that order is going to require the participation of entities that are not uh, sovereign. If you, it's, it's ridiculous to even imagine thinking about cyberspace, the rules of cyberspace, without bringing in the major Silicon Valley, without bringing in the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks, and others. Of course you have to. And so I would just think that we've got to be flexible in our mechanisms to bring in the actors that be and not, get, not, not see it through a prism of sovereign units. That's, that's just, again, it's, it's, that's increasingly obsolete. Let's talk a little bit about, let's, we've done a, a, a bit of a tour to the horizon, but, let, but let's, let's get into some of those places that really are uh, worrying you, starting with the Middle East. You talk about it as 
a place that's like the 30-year war. Yeah. Uh, how does that war end? Any well, different? Where, where, where do you, where do, what's driving what's happening in there? You've talked about the U.S. Sure. Well, uh, policy, but then where, where does that end? Well, and, and where does it, where do you see it The root out? causes of the, of the Middle East are not simply American acts of commission and omission. I think we, yeah, it's also just, this is a part of the world that never came up with how to put it, and never got comfortable with modernity. And it's, we talked about legitimacy. A lot of these governments and countries never established legitimacy within their borders, never forged a, a modern compact with their citizens, never established national identities. Indeed, it's one of the ironies of the world right now, by the way, that you have powerful national identities in parts of Europe and Asia and such weak national identities in parts of the, uh, of the uh, Middle East. Just saying. Uh, the, but Should be the other way around, but that's okay. Another way that the world's upside down. The, but the, the Middle East is, um, you know, you, you've got, you know, the reason I use the 30 years war analogy from the early 17th century is you've got political religious struggles within and across uh, borders. Uh, you have civil wars, you have proxy wars, you have regional wars, you have great powers um, adding uh, to it. These things tend not to burn out fast, particularly in an age of globalization where there's always more fighters, there's always more dollars, there's always more guns. So I think this could go on for, for quite a while uh, simmering. And as you said a minute ago, Evo, correctly, you've got, again, the range of actors is from non-state actors to, to major powers to regional powers. Uh, and lots in, be, uh, lots in between. Uh, so, I mean, the, the question is, uh, why is this going on? Yeah, it's for all those, it's all those reasons. It's hard to say, you know, what exactly, you know, some would date it. You know, I get tired a little bit of the dating back to Sykes-Picot, and, you know, at some point, you gotta stop making excuses about history and just, just take ownership of it. Uh, so I don't blame it on that or, or colonialism, but I do think it has something to do with the failure of modernization in large parts of the, uh, of the uh, Arab world. And again, I think we, we exacerbated things uh, in certain ways, but this, is, this has been going on for a while. It's not just the Arab world. You had the revolution in Iran in 79. You know, so this, this question of, of what, are, what are modern states and societies, what's the role of Islam? in political entities in this part of the world. This has never been settled. And I think this continues to churn. And since there aren't cl other clear loyalties or competing sense of citizenship or identity, I think you have this constant struggle as to what is the, what is the, the relationship between politics and religion. And that is not a healthy struggle. How do you see, do you have a crystal ball? How does this? Actually, I left, I, I left put it in one? my suitcase okay, and okay. I, I got lost. Um, no, I think uh, it goes on for quite a while. And I would say that we're not going back, you know, I, I call this the Rand McNally Middle East. I don't think we're going back to the Rand McNally Middle East. I don't think there's a high correlation between borders and reality, or maps and realities. I'm not suggesting we're going to go to a new one. That's where it, there's mm -hmm. not going to be a new treaty of Westphalia where we're going to have. So I actually think this very messy, sometimes in somewhere violent Middle East uh, continues. And I think you know, that, is, that is reality that policymakers then have to decide how ambitious do you want to be or not be. But my sense is there's a lot of churn with regional states like Iran, proxy forces like Hezbollah, non-state actors like, and right now it's ISIS or, or Al Qaeda, but in five years they'll have other names, but it'll be radical. Sunni groups of, of, of one sort. So I think the Middle East will remain in a kind of churn or turbulence and it will, the, the degree of intensity will go up and down. But I would think, in a, I don't expect to see Libya or Yemen or Syria or any of these places look like normal states where governments are in control of the entire territory and people are prepared uh, to accept the legitimacy of the, uh, and the writ of the central government. I just don't see that happening. Uh, I'm, my crystal ball ain't that good. We're going to open it up to, uh, uh, to the audience. Uh, so think about your question uh, and or vote on the questions that uh, are already there. We're going to, because it, it, it gives us another region, I'm going to give you yes, sir. Uh, one of the questions that has been voted 
I don't know, there are a lot of people interested in, uh, in Ukraine. But let, you, let me do you let vote me, on your questions here? Yeah, we can vote on questions. That's pretty cool. Uh, so you so get you, to, you, I you, hope you don't vote on the answers. Uh, no, <laughs> That only happens afterwards. Gotcha. Uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the more popular questions has to do with Ukraine. And the real, uh, yeah. rather than going into the specific question, what, what is Trump likely to do when it comes to the issue? That's the question. Okay, so of gonna, the restoration of sovereignty. So, so the question is, back I'll, to, I'll just say on every question about, <laughs> any question that begins with the following words, what is Mr. <laughs> Trump likely to do? The answer is, one, I have no idea. Two, you have no idea. Three, he may have no idea. So part of the reason, by the way, is the Trump administration in the national security doesn't exist. Evo's written you know, with Mac Dessler, an important book on the question, uh, on the whole role of the National Security Council in the process. Well, who's in place right now? You've got a national security advisor, a deputy. I, don't, I expect a few other people may be in there by now. Uh, you've got a Secretary of Defense, and you're soon going to have a Secretary of State. You have a Secretary of Homeland Security. That's about it. We're talking about what will ultimately be at the, at the highest, you know, above, say, what, Deputy Assistant Secretaries, confirmable level Assistant Secretaries and up, and senior people in the NSC, hundreds and hundreds of people. And they have to go through months and months of reviews of policy and, and so forth. So there is not a Trump administration uh, yet. So. I have no idea uh, what they are going to do. I would, but I, I would simply, what I am prepared to say is what I think we should and should not do, if you want to So let that. me, uh, let, so what, what should we do about the fact that Russia is, uh, has annexed part of one country and is occupying okay. part, another part of the country? So Ukraine, Russia. The part Russia. they've annexed, uh, I do not believe we should ever accept that. That overturn, to do so would overturn one of the fundamental building blocks of what order there is in the world. You can't uh, suddenly say, never mind, when it comes to a violation of perhaps the most fundamental precept of what order there, there, there is in the world, which is you can't use military force to change borders. You can't basically say there's a statute of limitations on that, no. So there has to be, that has to remain an op uh, that, that has to remain unacceptable and unaccepted. And there has to be a continuing price uh, or penalty exacted on Russia. Full stop. Full stop. Now, it doesn't preclude being able to work with Russia on other things, but you can't overlook that. That is just not, that's way, way, way too high of a price. And it goes beyond, the price you would pay would go beyond Ukraine. You don't want to teach the lesson that if you invade a country or part of a country and conquer it, that if, just, if, you, if you're just patient enough, the world will get used to it. Can't teach that lesson. Uh, what's going on in the East, it seems to me, is uh, dangerous in a different sort of way, because it, it, it's, it's clever. What the Russians are doing is, you know, again, I'm sitting next to the, you know, the NATO expert here. It's you know, what I call an Article 4 and a half violation. It doesn't quite trigger NATO type and obviously Ukraine's not in NATO, but it doesn't, it's not an overt invasion where, in a funny sort of way, we have the script about how to respond. I'm not saying it would be easy, but we know what it is we're meant to do. Things like this are in a kind of gray area. And so what I would say we want to do is give Ukraine greater capacity to deal with it. And I think uh, the previous administration, uh, the president in particular, was reluctant to do that, and I think that was an error. So I would correct that error, whether Mr. Trump will do that uh, there's no evidence he will, but I would, I would correct that error. And I would take this as a warning that we better think and think fast and hard about how we strengthen the rest of NATO that happens to be in the neighborhood of Russia to make sure that they are not equally vulnerable. So I would make the, re, the selective remilitarization, if you want to call it that, of NATO a priority. Some of this began in the latter years of the uh, Obama administration under Esh Carter and all that, and I think uh, to, to his and their credit, Europeans were involved in this. I think the Russian action in Ukraine got everybody's attention, but I want to see this continued in some ways possibly even, uh, even enhanced. I do not believe we can base Western security upon Russian self-restraint. Let me open it up all the way in the back. Um, question there, yes. It'll come on. Oh, hi, my name's Arpan Doshi. So my question is about your Sovereignty Plus or International Order 2.0. How does this differ from responsibility to protect as a norm? And if it is similar, 
uh, why is it necessary or sufficient because it exists and no one intervened in Syria? Great question. It's fundamentally different than responsibility to protect, which is a good thing. Uh, responsibility to protect is not uh, about sovereign obligation. It's just the, I mean, in a funny sort of way, it basically says if sovereigns act badly and either one way or another allow their own people to be massacred or do the massacring themselves, uh, they then forfeit some of the attributes of sovereignty and the rest of the world has a, a responsibility to act. Uh, the problem with that is uh, it's seen as a diminution of sovereignty. Uh, so, and indeed, if you try to get a vote, this was voted on in what, 2005, I think it was at the UN. If you took this to get vote today, it wouldn't pass. <coughs> and even if it did pass, it wouldn't be acted on. And uh, my one word, what is Aleppo? Aleppo is proof that it would not be acted on. Indeed, in the tragic irony of Syria, what were the big interventions in Syria? They were carried out by what countries? Iran and Russia. They were not quite humanitarian interventions as envisioned under R2P. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. That was the large international response. And what they were were interventions that made a terrible situation, orders of magnitude more horrible. Uh, the difference, though, between what I call sovereign obligation and responsible to protect is sovereign obligation accepts sovereignty and basically talks about how you, you build on it. So it's not, a, it's not an attempt to take away sovereignty. It's an, it's an attempt to get sovereign entities to assume a larger set of obligations in order to control, again, things that develop in their own territories that could have an adverse effect on, on others. Gentleman over there in the, uh, before I go. Oh, sorry, it's Andy. I was gonna say one other thing. Yeah. I also think what- It's the beard, Andy. What, and it's, it's the risk of making me unpopular, or more unpopular than I am. I think also one of the things that Syria shows is one of the phrases that I want to retire for the time being, but I'd love to re recover one day, is uh, international community. It's a phrase that's bandied about, but there really isn't much of one. And the whole idea of what I'm talking about with sovereign obligation of World Order 2.0 is to build a real international community, or what Headley Bull, uh, the person whose intellectual work influenced me most, called international society. Uh, but right now we use this phrase, uh, international community, as if it existed. And we constantly make appeals to the international community to do something. Well, guess what? There isn't much of one. And I think we, we've got to face up to that and try to build one rather than constantly uh, talking about it as if it existed. So you said you don't want to write a book called A World in Chaos. I'll, I'll give you a couple scenarios, and you can tell me how close you are to preparing to write that book. Uh, you're right. There is no Trump administration because there's so many positions unfilled. Rogan did a piece last week saying the Shadow Security Council is Steve Bannon, Jared Kushner, and, and Reince Priebus. And then he pointed out the grand strategist of the three was Steve Bannon, and one of his priorities is to link the Trump administration with populist movements in Europe. I mean, is this a real goal? Is Josh, you know, giving us a scare? Because if he does that, there is no EU. So your book, even the equation of who the great powers are, yep. and without the undersecretaries and the deputy secretaries, and I don't know if Toria Nuland is staying on, as the rumor is, but who's going to deal with the, the German election coming on, the French election coming on, populist parties from Greece to Italy are thrilled with what's going on here. Are, are, you going to be, are we going to have you here for a world in chaos next year? Well, as much as I'd like to come back to Chicago, and as much as I like to hang out with Evo, uh, I hope that would not be the context for two reasons. One is I sincerely hope the world is in chaos, and two, I sincerely hope not to write that book. Uh, Look, presumably it, it's a question of when and not if this administration staffs up. That's not the issue. The question is then how well it works and what its goals are. Let's take both those questions separately. How well it works, I don't know. I would simply say um, you've got a lot of cooks in the kitchen at the White House. And you've got a president, a vice president, you've got a chief strategist, you've got a chief of staff, 
you've got a senior advisor in Jared uh, Kushner, you've got Kellyanne Conway, you've got the national security advisor. This is, it's a crowded kitchen. And the question is, how is that going to work? And what's going to be the relationship between the White House and the departments? And how is the national security process going to work? And I would simply say, jury's out. But given the inbox this crowd faces, it had better work well. Uh, I would say that. The, uh, the stakes are, are large. The second thing I'd say, look, we're only, what, 80 hours into the new administration? So, so pace yourselves, by the way. Uh, breathe deeply. Got a ways to go. Uh, but it hasn't been a, a very reassuring few days. Uh, and for me, exhibit one is and was the inaugural address. Uh, I found large parts of that uh, extremely worrisome. The blatant call for protectionism, borne out a few hours ago by the decision to pull the plug on, on TPP. But even more broadly than that, the, the caricature, I thought, of uh, America's global role. It, it talked about the cost, but never the return on investment. It kind of created a guns versus butter dichotomy that I think just doesn't exist. You need both. Uh, it seemed to suggest that the problems domestically were the result of our foreign policy and our trade policy, which just is not uh, true. And then the entire America First prism, I think, is something that uh, does not play well for understandable reasons to the rest of the world and could lead the rest of the world to calculate their behaviors in a very narrow nationalistic uh, ways. So I, I worry a lot about that, and I worry about the support of uh, Brexit. And because I think, and I, I know Evo agrees with me here, I think the European project is one of the most creative and one of the most important departures from history, if you will, of the modern era. And it's, what, 65, 70 years old uh, now from the coal and steel community. But the whole idea to integrate Europe to such a degree that war would become unthinkable, where it, where it had, had become commonplace, that's a big, big, big idea. And the idea that David Cameron allowed a referendum to take place the way he did was, to me, reckless. And the way that people now are trying to build upon it is, to me, reckless. They are, they're playing with the stuff of history. And then, you know, I can't remember who I said years ago, but you know, this, it's like oxygen. I think this is it's the sort of thing you don't notice until you don't have enough of it. This is the stuff of stability in the world. And I feel to be, to be cavalierly playing with it and to set in motion historical trends that could lead to the unraveling of order in Europe. That's big, big stuff. And if that makes me the establishment or that makes me a conservative with a small c, so be it. But, um, but I, I, am very, I am very uneasy with this kind of taking for granted. It's, I made a comment this morning uh, on, on one of the sh on morning show, I guess it was, which will probably get me in trouble, like increasingly the things I say do. But I felt what we're seeing in foreign policy is the equivalent of a repeal and replace on Obamacare. And I'm seeing a lot of emphasis on repeal and not an emphasis on replace. So I see, we're seeing in foreign policy now repeal of the order that has largely, I think, served us well for three quarters of a century. The free trade regime, the alliance system, and so forth, the international institutions. But I don't see what's going to come in its place. So I am just, uh, I'm not against, indeed, I call for adaptation and change. But to simply repeal and to think that, this, that uh, narrow nationalisms are going to somehow maintain order in a way that our interests are going to be protected and preserved, uh, just don't see it. So interesting, the uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain gave an interview to the Financial Times uh, earlier this week in which he said that the message he would carry to Trump was not only the, uh, to President Trump, was not only the importance of NATO, which he would expect her to say, uh, but that the United States should, should strongly support a strong European Union. Good. So I, she gets it. Well, she, except um, for one thing. Well, she had a. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting to note that the Prime Minister of Great Britain believes this. That's great. Uh, as they are moving to a hard Brexit. Uh, it almost sounds like a definition of cognitive dissonance. Yes. Yes. 
That's why I thought it was an interesting. I, 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 I'm not sure how the message will be read. Yeah. Uh, we have an we have a question from uh, one of our uh, partner institutions, uh, WBEZ. Did Radio. it get a lot of like likes and? and no, 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 because it's on my piece of paper. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Caroline Rainey uh, from WBEZ, who asks uh, an important question: How can we work to solidify our relationship with longstanding allies abroad to strengthen democracy? Where is this idea of strengthening democracy in yeah. our foreign policy, and where does it where, where does it fit in the Richard Haas conception of world order 2.0? Okay. Le leave aside where it may fit in the next uh, administration or this administration. It doesn't fit that high in mind, in the sense that I would not make it a prerequisite of of cooperation. I, you know, don't get me wrong; I think it's desirable particularly mature democracies. I think Fareed Zakaria has, you know, has written quite eloquently about the danger of incomplete democracies. And what we're seeing in places like Turkey are powerful exhibits about how a little bit of democracy can be a dangerous thing, because uh, we're seeing the, the effective dismantling of democracy uh, there. But look, I'd say three things on it. One is um, in things like China and Russia, as much as I'd like to see them be more open or liberal, I don't think we should make that a prerequisite for our willingness to work with them in other areas. Uh, we need to work with them in these other areas, and our ability to make them more liberal is, is quite finite. Uh, secondly, uh, we should, though, be in the business of trying to help countries become more de democratic. And I think the best thing we can do is uh, be in the business of trying to promote civil society constitutional checks and balances and so forth. You've got to be very careful about being in the elections business. Elections can become uh, legitimizers of sham democracies, and we've seen that uh, all too often. Thirdly, um, I guess um, I write in the book about the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, so let me use another medical phrase, physician heal thyself. Now, it's the best thing we can also do is be an example of a democracy that others will want to emulate. And that means having our politics in Washington not be dysfunctional, being able to tackle some of the real problems and challenges facing uh, this country, to, to basically be, to set examples that others will want to uh, uh, follow. And so, I mean, I think some of the best things we've done in the case of democracy was the civil rights movement and things like that. So we have peaceful uh, reform in, in, in this country. It becomes inclusive. We have opportunity. Uh, our economy flourishes, and when these things happen, the rest of the world wants to be more like us. But, but when we have things like the 2008 financial crisis, or our politics get dysfunctional and we can't deal with debt, we have government shutdowns, and the rest of the rest of the world goes, why do we want to be at all like them? So we really want to promote democracy, be a successful one, and be one that others will respect and admire. Gentlemen here in the uh, third row, yes. You haven't mentioned Israel. What is the strategic importance of Israel, and how do they fit with border integrity and some of your other issues? Look, um, Israel is one of our more or most important partners uh, in the world, certainly in that part of the, uh, the world. I would say uh, I don't think Israel is central to some of the uh, struggles which I, in the region. I think that a lot of those struggles are more internal. Israel could get more central if. Jordanian stability were challenged in ways that it hasn't been since uh, 1970. Uh, but I, I don't think the Israelis will be central to how what I call this 30 years warlike struggle in the, in the Middle East uh, play, play, play out. Uh, I'd say a few more things, though. I think the Israelis, um, we need to recreate uh, real strategic dialogue and trust between the United States and Israel. Evo mentioned that I worked for President Bush the father of 41. One of the most amazing moments in my tenure there was the night the uh, Iraqi scuds rained down on Israel. And the uh, Israeli Minister of Defense uh, called uh, Dick Cheney, who was then the American Secretary of Defense, and asked that we, uh, it's, called, it's called IFF, the Identify Friend or Foe, we, we give them the codes so their airplanes could fly, and our airplanes would not accidentally shoot them down. And um, I argued we should not. I was the chief Middle East advisor at the White House, that it would complicate the, what we were doing <coughs> in terms of the politics of the coalition. We didn't need the involvement militarily. We could do those things. 
And that argument won the day. So Secretary of State Baker and President Bush got in touch with uh, Prime Minister Shamir and basically said, I know we're asking you the most difficult thing you could ask any country, particularly Israel, given its history, but we're asking you not to retaliate. And the Israelis had hours and hours of cabinet meeting. And at the end, Prime Minister Shamir trusted President Bush enough that he said, OK, we will not retaliate. We, will let you, uh, we, were, we respect your equities. And we, we will trust you to do what is necessary. That, to me, was one of the most extraordinary examples of real strategic trust and cooperation I'd ever witnessed. I don't, we're not there. To say we're not there today is to underestimate it. We have got to get back. Because I can imagine situations where Jordan's stability is questionable. There's a crisis around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Lebanon, again, is something of a civil war. Who knows what with Iran or Saudi Arabia. We have got to have that kind of intimacy uh, with Israel. So I would say that's a real priority. I don't think there's uh, much mileage to be gained by pushing the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I just don't think the prerequisites for peace are there. I'd love to be proven wrong. I uh, hope I'm proven wrong. But I, I just um, don't see it. And even if I am wrong, even if it were to happen, I don't think it, it wouldn't be critical to the Syrian civil war or, or Libya or Yemen or anywhere else. It doesn't hold the key to the region. It would be very important for Israelis and Palestinians. But I'm, I'm frankly skeptical that it's uh, about to happen. But I, I also want to, as bad as things are, they can get worse. And one, I have two rules in the Middle East. You know, one is that the enemy of your enemy can still be your enemy. And the other is things have to get even worse before they get even worse. And I don't want to see things get even worse in the Middle East. And the crisis around the holy places in Jerusalem would be just that. So one of the things we want to be is working closely with Israelis and others about how do we present things, how do we manage things so they, uh, we reduce the chances of violence in the holy places. Because that would have implications not just the region, but all over the world. 1.4 or 1.5 billion Muslims would react uh, to that. And one of the things I'm glad to see is at least temporarily seems to be a holding off on the idea of move, moving the US embassy to Jerusalem. That's the kind of thing I believe. Uh, I don't see any real upside, but I see real risk that, among other things, it could spark certain types of reactions, which would have both local but potentially worldwide, uh, worldwide consequences. You talked about trade, and, and one of the questions here is, is, is about trade. It's, yeah. it's the, whether the strict bilateral approach mm -hmm. to trade, uh, particularly if you're going to do it with your allies and partners, yeah. uh, is going to work or not. Well, the problem with bilateral approaches is they're incredibly time consuming, they're incredibly inefficient, and they can't tackle certain challenges, which are, only make sense to tackle if they're global. Take subsidies. You can't say to a government, well, you, you have to take out your subsidies bilaterally, but, how is, but not multilaterally. It just doesn't work. Uh, so it's, it's very, very difficult to uh, do. So the, that's why large regional or better yet global agreements are by far preferable. And you would deal with issues that you want everyone to buy into, things like subsidies, things like currency uh, manipulation. You want to deal with protection of property. So you want to deal with the issues that most current trade agreements haven't dealt with. And you want to enforce the rules that you've got. So bilateralism is wildly inefficient. Now, is it, is it worse than nothing? No. And my feeling is if you, if you can't get global, you get regional. If you can't get regional, you get bilateral. So you, you get trade agreements where you can. Uh, I would say, though, that if we're going to get them, besides that, we've got to look inward. And we've got to recreate a domestic political consensus for it. And then you know, I heard some of your upcoming meetings. But you're going to have to deal with some of the issues that trade is being scapegoated for. But it's not. But you have to deal with job disappearance. You have to come up with uh, what we used to call trade adjustment assistance. I would actually rename it, which is really it's just um, it's worker adjustment assistance. It doesn't matter whether it's trade or technology or innovation. You've got to help people retrain, get re-educated. You need wage insurance to top off salaries when people uh, lose some of their, their income because jobs have gone away. You need portability of virtually every form of, uh, of the safety net. Uh, so we, we need to create a society where we're much more flexible and we can deal with the reality that a, a front-loaded education, which is what we have in this country now, is not going to be enough to get people through the next 50 years of their, of their lives or careers. And unless we start doing that sort of stuff, uh, you know, the reason trade is so unpopular is you don't get a chance to vote on globalization. 
but you do get a chance to vote on trade agreements. So it has become, you know, this is pin the tail on the donkey. This is your opportunity to voice your frustration with what's going on. And the problem is it's being scapegoated and blamed for lots of things it's, it's not to blame for. And in the meantime, we're, we're not deriving its benefits, which are, which are many. But I'm a realist, and so my view is how do we change the domestic political environment so we can again have trade agreements? So whether you have them bilateral, regional, or global, you're not going to have them no matter what unless you create a, a political space here where people will once again uh, support it. There's a question over here. Yes, yes ma'am. If you, if you can wait for it. They you want you to wait for the microphone. microphone. Then so you're recorded. Everybody can hear it. And, and then this way it's for immortality. Um, I'm going back to Russia and Putin. My question to you is, would it be helpful if our administration engages Putin and Russia in a respectful way mm -hmm. and not in a poisonous way as we are perceived in Russia now, disrespecting Russians, disrespecting Putin? Mm -hmm. Isn't Crimea reaction to what this ad former administration uh, did uh, in terms of uh, our Russian relationships? Well, I don't. One of my few rules, I don't have a lot of rules, is, but one of my few rules is I don't try to um, guess, because I don't know any of the board, what, what motivates people to do what they do. So I don't exactly know why Mr. Uh, Putin did what he did in Crimea. Uh, I, I assume, like most people, he was motivated by a number of concerns. Uh, but let me take your larger point. Uh, look, of course we should talk to the Russians. I, I never see diplomacy as a favor we bestow. Diplomacy is one of the tools in our kit bag, and we should use it. And uh, we should consult with them, talk to them, conversations with them. Uh, we should show them respect. Uh, doesn't doesn't hurt you to do that. Uh, and I think we should look at all aspects of our relationship. I mean, from arms control, conventional and nuclear. Uh, we should look at areas we can potentially cooperate, and, but also we should, we should look after our own interests. And that's why I said before we should do things like remilitarize uh, parts of, um, of, of NATO. But yeah, I wanna, I'd be happy to have envoys sent there and talk to them about anything and everything, talk about the conditions under which we would uh, relieve certain, some of the sanctions. So I would be, I would be very pleased. Uh, I would also make clear under certain conditions that we are, we're, not, we're not aiming to bring about regime change in Russia. I would think about what the formulation is, but I would conceivably introduce that if it were coupled with some Russian statements or actions that we wanted. I would be very careful, again, uh, I wouldn't state it publicly or explicitly about going ahead with more NATO enlargement at this time. I wouldn't say we're not going to do it. I just wouldn't necessarily do certain things. In any case, Ukraine and Georgia aren't, at the moment, don't fulfill NATO's qualifications. I, again, I would defer to the gentleman to my right here. Uh, so I don't think we need to do certain things. But again, I would, I, I want to resurrect a much more comprehensive but reciprocal relationship. And yeah, respectful with, because uh, my goal is not to humiliate or alienate Russia, but my, and let's say one other thing. My goal is also not to have friendly relations with Russia per se. I think that's an important point. The goal of foreign policy is not to be liked. It's not to have friendly relations or quote unquote good relations. What we want to see is certain kinds of behaviors, what we would consider to be improved behaviors on the part of a country like Russia. If that happens, then we will have better relations. But the goal is not to paper over our differences and simply in, in diplomatic niceties. So again, the purpose is not to have a friendly relationship. The, po the, the, the goal of our foreign policy should be to see that Russia or other countries, not, that's not simply Russia, that they act in ways that we believe are consistent with certain principles and norms and rules, certain kinds of restraints. Hopefully they'd buy into some of what Eve and I were talking about earlier about what I call World Order 2.0. If that happens, we will have better relations. And, but it's, it's, it's a question of, 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 of sequencing, if you will. Question uh, again from the, uh, our electronic media here, climate change. Where do you see the multilateral global effort go given some of the skepticism that may be expressed by the, uh, by the incoming administration? 
kind of snuck in a, you want me to predict what the administration's going no, to do? No, no. Okay, like the... Uh, how, do you, how do you see that regime evolving? Yeah. You actually talk about it I know the, yeah. as a, from a sovereign obligation perspective. I, look, I think uh, the Paris Agreement is a modest but important agreement. It's, and it's both for the same reason. Unlike previous attempts at, uh, of, the, of the world dealing with climate change, it didn't try to establish a single price or tax on carbon. It didn't create a, a market system, a so-called cap and trade. It didn't basically take a top-down approach. Instead, what it did was it said, look, come to this conference. You decide what you think is a, an ambitious but sustainable trajectory when it comes to how you're going to manage your, your emissions over the next five years. Uh, and you know, live up to that. And then also try to be generous about how you contribute to other countries who have to adapt to the climate change that's already baked into the cake. And this is an interesting model of, of multilateralism. It's bottom up. It, it reflects, you keep total sovereign control over what it is you do. All the outside world can do is name and shame you if you don't live up to it. You'll have to deal with the political consequence of that. They can give you some money to help you if you lack money or give you, transfer you some technology if you, you lack that. But this is not supranationalism that infringes upon sovereignty. So I actually think it's quite an imaginative idea. Now, the downside is obviously it's no better than the sum total of national ambitions. And at the moment, even if all the national ambitions that were put on the table in Paris were realized, uh, the overall effect would, only, would be approximately half of what the goal was in terms of cumulative effects on climate change. So you have a long ways to go. And it's not clear that every country will live up to its uh, stated goals. And obviously, some of them hedged on their goals, so they, they didn't set themselves up to fail. But it's possible that over time, as technology gets better, fuel shifting is more widely in, introduced, that we could do OK on climate change. And what you're also seeing in places like India and China, we alluded to it before, is the politics of climate change are changing domestically. What's going to pressure them to do better is not going to be some, some international mechanism. It's going to be domestic political demands to satisfy citizens. So I actually think Paris is quite an interesting innovation. And it's one, again, yeah, as you say, entirely consistent with what I am uh, suggesting. We're seeing it also in the health area, countries dealing with uh, trying to prevent or monitor or deal with uh, infectious disease outbreaks. I think it's, it's potentially an approach to uh, international relations that's quite practical, because so, you don't fight sovereignty. Instead, you, uh, you, you work with it. A couple minutes left for one final question, which is not related to your book, but your job. How does, how does what is happening, this world in disarray, affect, and the changes that are going, affect the way the New York Council on Foreign Relations or Chicago Council on Global Affairs? What, are, what is the role that we play? Is it change? Is it, is it the same? We do the same thing we used to do? Uh, actually, how no, do you I, think about it? I think about it a lot. Yeah. Uh, and the answer is, um, and I've been thinking about it for years, the, the recent election campaign and the rest have uh, reinforced it and accelerated it. Look, institutions like mine were, when I'm lucky enough to work at, uh, you know, were brought into existence about 100 years ago. Uh, and they were self-defined elite institutions. And the idea was uh, to have these small conversations about this country's relationship with the world. And if you influence the members or the members had direct access to people in power, you could make a real difference. And that was essentially the operating premise of uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And that part of us still exists. It's still a, a relatively, out of, or it's 5,000 members out of 320 million people in this country. Uh, and w a lot of what we do, like a lot of what is done here, is done at a, a, an informed level. Uh, it's, in a, it's the goal of speaking truth to power, and it's to be creative. It's to be analytically robust. It's to, it's to say things that they may not want to hear, but you think they need to hear. And it's also to give them ideas. I mean, we talked before about cyber. That's a perfect area where there's ver the intellectual input has lagged behind the technology. And that's a place where outsiders can and should make a difference. So the issue we were just talking about, job loss. If you want to resurrect support for trade, how do you make this society better able to cope with, with, job, with pressure on existing jobs? We know we're going to lose millions of drive, jobs associated with vehicles as they become driverless. Well, how do you deal with that? You can't become a Luddite, so what do you do? I mean, there's, there's, there's powerful questions. Uh, 
uh, you know, I try to deal with one in this book, which is what ought to be the operating system of the world given globalization and all that. So I think there's, there's a need to speak truth to power, to be analytically robust, and to be as intellectually creative as you can. That's, uh, to use a phrase I used before, that's all necessary, it's not sufficient. We've got to have a larger public role. And that means putting out uh, facts. Uh, it means uh, putting out analyses. Uh, essentially, you need a more informed citizenry in this country. We need an informed citizenry if our democracy is going to work, if our uh, elected representatives or would-be elected representatives are going to be held accountable. Uh, we need people who can join the military, the intelligence community, the diplomatic corps, and others. We need people there. We need people to go around the world in American business or NGOs. And we, so one of the things I did around six or seven years ago at the council is that our, our biggest new mission is going to be to try to create a sense of global, a reality of global literacy in this country. And my goal is that every college graduate, if, uh, when you get a degree, that degree means that you have a certain level of knowledge of and familiarity with uh, how the world operates and what its implications are for the world. And I would love that to be a required, something that's required on every college campus and in many high schools. And we're now developing all sorts of learning materials for students and teachers. And we've made this the biggest single area of growth. So my view is institutions like yours and mine, or like ours, um, have to deal with, uh, in both a, a narrow kind of inside the bubble, people who are doing this for a living, kind of that sort of a conversation, but have to have a much broader public role, uh, whether in cities, states, or you know, we're a national organization. Uh, that would, but I, so I think we have a real obligation to do that. And, and you know, for us, we've, you, know, you can't do everything, but so we're trying to aim at you know, students a lot. We're trying to aim at um, uh, educators, at religious leaders, uh, you know, uh, journalists, people who have uh, large followings. And the idea, again, is to ultimately have a, you know, I'm old fashioned, but I believe that a more informed citizenry is one of the requirements of a, of a successful uh, democracy. So we're trying to do our bit. Richard, uh, this is part of How to Inform the Citizenry. Great book. Thanks so much Thank for spending you. an hour with, uh, with us here today. Thank you. Um, if, everybody, if everybody could please stay where they are so Richard can actually get out of the door and be at the place where you're going to sign and books that people are going to buy. So uh, if you can give him a minute.